on this page, where it says creation of the Leviathan force and uh, related history. This gives you a basic idea of a little bit of what came before, <laughs> just a real rough rundown. We have 250 million years ago, a human, human angelic human seeding one took place on parallel Earth, and they were called the uh, Paladorian Cloisters. 25 million years ago, the, um, the five Paladin, Palladian Cloister races were seeded on Earth over here. So we've been here for 25 million years. 5,500,000 um, years ago, Human seeding one on Earth was destroyed in the Electric Wars. 3,700,000 years ago, human seeding two was started. 848,800 years ago, human seeding two was destroyed via the Thousand Years' War. And all of these wars, guess who they were with? It's like the same beings. It was the Anu Elohim and the Fallen Draconian races versus the Emerald Covenant races. And it was all about... Templar quest, which is territorial quest for the stargates. But it wasn't just stargates on one planet. It was stargates in this whole 15-dimensional time matrix that they were after. Now, 798,000 BC, we had the five Palladia Urtite cloister races were seeded here. This was seeding three, the beginning of seeding three. You can read, because I'm not going to go into just, you know, talking just about our seedings. What I want to do is get to the Leviathan races. Just know from 798,000 B.C., that was the beginning of our third seeding, and our races progressively you know, were put here, the angelic human and the indigo races. Then there were a couple of other things that happened where um, between 669,000 B.C. and 250,000 B.C., there were the Rama and the Templar Wars, and these were a mess. You had Anunnaki and Draconian invasions from all over. I mean, spaceship invasions. Things coming in with, like, uh, sonic beams, photosonic beams that could make matter dematerialize when it got hit with it. I mean, <laughs> big wars, that kind of thing. Um, we had a, a race of um, pre-Leviathan fallen angelic hybrid things called the Nephidim. They were Draconian. And another called the Arantia. These were Jehovian Anunnaki hybrids. These were the beginning of the Illuminati races. The Illuminati races were upgraded from this point and merged with something else. Now, that I'll talk about it in a minute. Um, in this period of the Rama and Temple Wars, the races, the Nephidim and the uh, Arantia races, were not able to fully procreate with angelic human races. They were originally created through forced laboratory experimentation in some of the earlier seedings. And in some of the earlier seedings, in seeding two, there was an experiment done, again, a biogenesis experiment to try to help the fallen ones, that allowed natural procreation between the angelic human races and a certain small collective of fallen ones supposed to be not, you know, wanting to get out of being fallen. And that turned into an absolute disaster. That's where we ended up with a seed race that went on and they took it off planet. The fallen angelics took it off planet and it became kind of like a core genetic template to upgrade their progressive building of a master invader race. Now, we learned our lesson in seeding two, so we weren't going to do that again right away. And in seeding three, the angelic human races and the, the uh, indigo races were created in a way that they could not naturally hybridize, w through re naturally procreate with any of the fallen angelic forces, which gave them protection from the fallen angelic forces. In 250,000 B.C., there was a period of time where you had what are called the Palladian Nibiru and Anunnaki races. They're from Nibiru and from the Pleiades star system. Um, these were the guys that in, in Sumerian history came down as Enki and Enlil and Marduk. Those gods? Gods. <laughs> yeah, they were gods. They were race lines that, when we get into the genealogies, that we won't get too heavily into today, but the, these were race lines of, of fallen angelic Anunnaki races. Some of them crossed with one thing, some of them crossed with another. Um, the Enki, Enlil, and Marduk races, Anunnaki races, were considered, um, uh, what do they call them? He had the Jehovian, there, there's a name, oh, the Anu Seraphim. These were called the Anu Seraphim Anunnaki races. They weren't the original strain. The original strain were Anu Elohim out of the Giovanni crew, and they were called the Jehovian 
Anunnaki races. The Jehovian Anunnaki races looked at themselves as the true, pure strain Anunnaki, and they didn't like the other ones. The other ones had crossed with various ones of the fallen Seraphi, be it draconian ones or some of the things that the draconians had created. So the Palladian Nibiruan Anunnaki races are Anunnaki races that have um, partial Seraphi or draconian type coding. You have the uh, Enki and Lil Marduk groups. Um, what were the full names of those? They're in Voyages, Volume 2. The Enki Zephelium. Okay, Enki Zephelium races, the Enlil Odetochron. Okay, so if you look at the Enki Zephelium, now Zephelium are one of the um, fallen races that are connected to the Zeta races that we talk about now. And they were a reptilian snake type cross. Okay, so they took Anunnaki, which was a core Anunnaki was an aquatic ape. All right, that was the original form. An, ape, uh, an aquatic ape hominid was the original Anunnaki form. So you take that and you cross it with, uh, for an Enki family line, you, you, they would cross it with uh, the Zephelium. Uh, so it's Enki Zephelium. That's the Toth line. All right, now Toth is a Nibiruan. Anunnaki, he was uh, an, out of the Enki family. Okay. Now Enlil, or crossed with Odetochron, so they call him the Enlil Odetochron. Now that would be a more reptilian, fully reptilian, as opposed to snake, more of a, a reptile, think salamanders and things. Okay. <laughs> and you have the Marduk group, which crossed with Omicron, which were the dragon moth people and the dinoids. So these are the Anuseraphim, Anunnaki races. And they've forever been trying to get the territory here. These are the ones that set up the Nibiru and Dada crystal grid in 25,500 BC. But way back in 250,000 BC, they were coming in here speculating for various things. One of the things they were speculating for was gold, because they had depleted Nibiru's um, resources of organic gold. Now, they used gold in a very specialized way. They, through laboratory um, ionization, they call it, they create what's called, uh, in contemporary terms, and it used to be called this in Egypt too, white powder gold, which is a substance that has the ability to create, let's say, electrical sparks within the atomic structure that allow more energy to be pulled in from the field around you. So it assists in sustaining immortal life. Not eternal life, but immortal life. There's a difference. You don't want to be immortal. <laughs> eternal, yes. Immortal, there are better things to do. But because they were running out of natural gold in their planetary system and the Palladian system was devoid of it, it didn't have any to, to mine, Earth was very rich in organic, you know, elemental gold. They literally, on Nibiru, once they created Nibiru in a way where it was in its artificial orbit and like, um, it's an orbit that runs partially through the phantom matrix and then back up through our gates and into our system. It used to be in our system completely. But when it fell, they created an orbit that runs between the two systems. And every uh, 3,657.8 years, it cycles back through. So to sustain their, their uh, atmosphere, they had literally changed their atmosphere and you found a way to imbue this elemental gold ionized particulate structure into this white powder gold substance into their atmosphere so they breathed it and after many generations of that it sustained the metatronic body is what it did it helped to sustain the metatronic body after many generations of this they couldn't survive without it and there was all sorts of mutations happening on their planet with their peoples because they were running out of the amounts of gold needed to create this in the atmosphere. So they were on speculation journeys, trying to find places where they could rob more gold from. And this is where we got our original value of gold, actually, why it's so important. That was an Anunnaki trait. It's very important to the Anunnaki races because it helps them to sustain their immortal status in, in their bodies. And now that their bodies are mutated fully into the Metatronics, if they don't have some degree of that frequency that's created through white powder gold in their systems, they begin to rapidly deteriorate. Their physical forms rapidly begin to deteriorate and their consciousness begins to fragment because they don't have a soul structure anymore that they're directly connected to. So, in uh, 250,000 BC, you had the Enki, Enlil, and Marduk, Palladian, Nibiru, and Anunnaki coming in and attempting to mine gold. And they created, they started warring with each other because no, nobody liked to work the mines. And it was like, well, you know, you, why should we work the mines? You work the mines. And they started to war with each other. 
So they decided to end that, that war amongst themselves. They were going to create a slave race, a, a slave race that would do the mining for them. And we were on the planet at the same time. The angelic humans and the indigos were. And we were in like certain parts, usually associated with the Stargate and the Q-site locations. They were our, always our seeding grounds. And there are lots of raids by these guys trying to you know, grab humans and do things with them. But they decided to create, they didn't want something as intelligent as an angelic human, because you're not going to control it, basically. They wanted something across between an animal and something that had some degree of intelligence where you could put it on autopilot and it would do what you told it to. So they created um, a race called the Lulkus. They created the Lulkus by taking their own imprint, their aquatic ape hominid imprint, and combining, with, combining it with the gene code, a small portion of the genetics of angelic humans that had been captured in their raids. And they did it in a laboratory. They created it in a laboratory, like our scientists are starting to play around now. And they combined it with the, the angelic human, their aquatic ape, and I believe two other. One was an ape-like strain of animal from Nibiru, and the other was a monkey strain. It was a strain of monkey primate from are, you know, from this planet. And what they came up with, or what we call, or scientists call, the Neanderthal. That was the beginning. And that's where the Neanderthals fit in. These had nothing to do with human evolution. They weren't a part of it at all. But boy, have they tried to uh, put Darwinian theory in there. So we start to think of ourselves as them. All right. So they created the Lulkus Neanderthal. They were called the, the Lulkus. They were a primate hominid slave race. And they were able to create them. And they had a nut. They had a certain sophistication of intelligence, even though other ways they were very um, slow-witted compared to what a human is now, even now as homo sapiens. But they had genetics that had a little bit of the angelic human imprint because of the part that they had literally robbed from the gene code. It's like grabbing a body, um, killing the person, but taking part of the DNA and using a select part of that DNA to cross it with other DNA. This is how they did it. It's laboratory messing. All right, so that created the slave races of the Neanderthal in uh, 246,000 BC. The, there was, uh, the, and this was like the, the beginning of a new wave of evolution after the Rama Wars and the Temple Wars, where they created a mess. I mean, there, there was it was getting close to becoming another Electric Wars situation where everything got destroyed, and finally there were some agreements made in 246,000 BC. The Maharaji, which are the blue humans from Sirius B on behalf of the Iani and the founders, um, brought in the Emerald Covenant restatement, which was brought in the information about the Emerald Covenant again, brought in the CDD plates, and said, you know, any of you, you know, be you hybrid or not, if you want to join the Emerald Covenant, you can. So this is when we were given the last set of CDD plates, the ones that were drawing information from now. They were given in 246,000 BC. Now, interestingly, the, all of the angelic humans agreed to, you know, yes, of course we want to do Emerald Covenant. We've always been Emerald Covenant. But the Toth Enki Anunnaki decided to go over into the Emerald Covenant at that period. So that was 246,000 BC when Toth, as a, a being, Toth was a, an Anunnaki being, entered the, the Emerald Covenant for bioregenesis to get their DNA template back. Now, Toth went through, as a, as a person, went through his own levels of bioregenesis, and he did very, very well. He got up to 11 strands, but he didn't get the 12th one before he bailed out and went the other way. But to the Toth Anki Anunnaki races, they entered for bioregenesis, and there was a series of steps in this bioregenesis that was created, that was taken. They wasn't all, you didn't get all of the strands healed immediately. There was a progressive integration of one strand after another after another that would take place over numerous generations to slowly build up the pattern of the D12 that the, the, the angelic human hybrid strand would be put into the Anunnaki strands. What it would do is you have, if you look at the strands, is one angelic human strand had all the natural mathematics of the divine blueprint that goes with this time matrix. The Anunnaki strand had it all in reverse and didn't have 12 um, let's say, um, units. Okay, say so we have 12 units in one angelic human strand. They only had 11 units. The draconian ones only had 10 units in each strand. 
So they had to progressively, for each strand, build up a 12 subharmonic pattern where they'd get that extra back and reverse it back to its natural mathematics before they would be compatible with the frequencies in the natural time matrix, before they could run the divine blueprint frequencies again. So this was what this experiment was about. It wasn't an experiment to see what had happened. It was an experiment that was done, a healing experiment, that had... Uh, you know, the uh, objective of healing this particular group of Anunnaki who decided to go into the Emerald Covenant. Um, in 208,216 BC, there was a ma this was a stellar activation cycle, and consistently with the rest of our history, um, during every stellar activation cycle, there was an invasion of some sort, and there was a Drac invasion. This time it created what was called the Fall of Brenaway. This was when literally in doing the round tables all right the rainbow round tables that the guardian races were always appointed to do to run the templar here in order to you know uh, assist the planet in grounding the stargate frequencies um they were infiltrated and invaded and the rounds began being run in reverse because people were careless and they there was a lot of intermarrying between nephidim draconian hybrids that supposedly were being good guys now working the emerald covenant and angelic human races and angelic humans didn't realize that they were getting code reversals in their dna templates so when they ran the rounds they ran them in reverse and it created there's a major pole shift that took place in that period because again the gates had to be cut, uh, shut they had to be shut or our whole template, Earth's template, would have gone into phantom matrix completely. So, in 208,216 BC is when we lost our ability to run D12 frequency because what's called the stellar bridge, which is that frequency spiral, the Merkaba spiral of the universal level, that spirals the frequency down from D12 through all the universal gates to us, it's supposed to anchor on what's called a 12-code pulse. 12 code pulse means every dimensional frequency band has 12 subharmonics. It didn't. It anchored on a 10 code pulse and they blocked the other part out with the reversal of the round tables. So from that point on, we were like sitting ducks here because we didn't have D12 frequency available. We only had D10 frequency available. That means we couldn't reset anything with the divine blueprint without the D12 frequency to come in and reset it. So after this, the there was you know, I mean, life went on. <laughs> there was a pole shift, and, you know, there was a bringing... The, the races during these times were taken into the inner Earth, like the angelic human races, and any of the hybrid races that could sustain the strand activation would be taken into inner Earth and, you know, allowed to hang out there until it stabilized on the surface, then they'd be brought back out. And the angelic humans were always reseeded on the 24 sites, the 12 Q sites and the 12 Stargate sites. That was their home, and their, their, their DNA is literally keyed to those grids. So we all have literally a place on the planet that we belong to, <laughs> and it technically belongs to us. We belong to each other. All right. Now, in 155... Wait a minute. Yeah, okay. 155,000 B.C. This is when um, the Anunnaki Biogenesis program begins in full. Now, way back in 246,000 B.C. is when Toth, the Tothenki group entered the Emerald Covenant, but it wasn't until 155,000 B.C., because of all the chaos that was going on, that it actually began, where the, the hybridization program began. And the Lucas Neanderthal races, because they had a little bit of the human imprint, were used as the base species for this hybridization. So the Lucas Neanderthal were combined with a pattern, a, a piece of the DNA, from another race called the Hibornian humans. The Hibornian humans had to do with seeding too, and certain races that were created through hybridizing between human and, uh, and uh, Anunnaki races. They were a type of, of Nephilim, actually, Nephilim human, but they were of the ruby order that were trying to get their full imprint back originally. So upgrade number one, they went from Locus Neanderthal to what are called the Luhari, which was Cro-Magnon one. And then in 152,000 BC, the Luhari hybrids were crossed with the Urantia urtite cloister humans, and upgrade two was done, and they created the Iluli Levi. Here we get the races of Levi and such. This is where we get the word Leviathan. Now, the Iluli Levi, Cro-Magnon II, was the first one of the hybrids that was capable of natural procreation with a human where it could actually conceive a child and bear a living child with a human. The others were still not genetically compatible to that degree, 
where fertilization would most often not occur, and if it did, it would be highly mutated and it would die. You know, the, the, the child could not be born by them. This began the chaos, technically speaking, because if you now have a hybrid race, and if you get a hold of that hybrid race and you're a fallen angelic, and you know that race can now naturally procreate, all you have to do is have your hybrid race rape humans, and you will create progressively more of your own in human form. And this is what began the craziness that became the Leviathan invasion. But the bioregenesis continued for the races. The Tothenki groups were still part of this. They were still you know, working with it. And the Tothenki groups are interesting because, remember how I said before, they were of the Anu Seraphim, which means they were Anunnaki combined with certain of the fallen Seraphim, which were the Draconians or the Reptilians. So they could actually, by using their DNA, they could actually allow for both draconian races to incarnate into them and Anunnaki races. So it was a hybrid form that could be used to do bioregenesis for both fallen seraphim races like the draconians or reptilians and fallen Anu Elohim races like the Anunnaki. And it was also part of the downfall because both of them could infiltrate that race, therefore. All right. So 152,000 BC, we had Cro-Magnon II, the Iluli Levi races. From the Iluli Levi races, it went up from there. 151,000 B.C., upgrade 3 was done. Iluli Levi became Iluli Judah. This is where we get the races that were transposed in our biblical text. They're not our tribes of Israel. These are the tribes of the Leviathan, and they were not part of those original biblical texts. The original 12 tribe human races were part of those original texts, and they transposed their race identity and their records into our books. Okay. 150,000 B.C., there was a mess, um, but we had a glacial period after that one because the Jehovian Anunnaki attacked here and tried to take over, but they didn't win. But they crashed the firmaments, which are called hydro suspension fields that controlled the planetary climate. We actually had planetary climate control at various periods where you could, <laughs> kind of like your car or your house, and you set it on climate control. <laughs> you know, how much humidity you want, what temperature you want, you know, that kind of thing. You can do that with the crystal pylon temples of inner earth, for, of the, you know, Eka line. They can modulate the frequencies here in a way that through our gates, we can get climate control and well when they're working properly so in uh, in the Jehovian wipeout in 150,000 BC we had a glacial period because uh, a large part of our firmaments or the hydro suspension fields collapsed 148,000 BC the next uh, upgrade was done the they became the upgrade 4 created the Iluli Nef the, the Iluli Nephi races and then there was a whole bunch of these guys the Nephi races that were infiltrated by Jehovian Anunnaki and created the, um, what are called the Nephites. This is why certain teachings say, oh, you know, ha hail the return of the Nephites. They're supposed to be coming back in this time period. Not something to hail unless you're looking forward to becoming a Jehovian Anunnaki. And these, large numbers of these, have joined the Wesedek groups, you know, from this history forward. So the return of the Nephites has to do with the return of the Metatronic coding. Here we go again. This, every stage of this uh, hybridization program had its, its pros and its cons, meaning pros that it was actually serving the purpose it was intended for the ones who stayed in the Emerald Covenant, the Toth groups, then other ones that came in. One of the ones that came in um, later, I believe, in, in fact, in this period, I think, this is the first period they came in, I think, yeah, 148,000 B.C., the being called Enoch, who had been an ascended master and the good, good guy side had come in and incarnate specifically through the Jehovian Anunnaki fallen pattern to be able to try to bring them back up into bioregenesis. The Enoch crew got involved and these were the Arcturian Jehovian Anunnaki races from the Arcturus system from Orion and Arcturus and they were different than, from the Palladian Iberian ones and they tended to not like each other very much. Um, they got involved with the, the Nephi level. They came into the experiment at the Nephi level. And so then you had two groups of Leviathan race, or yeah, Leviathan because they're all out of Levi, but usually we use Leviathan in terms of the Illuminati, what became the Illuminati. But there were two branches of these hybrid races that were created. One were the sons of Belil, and the others were the sons of Zadok. All right. And these are they were the which were the reversals of they were originally the sons of uh, Lilib the Lilibim which were Toth's crew the ones that were on the good side and this is where you get like the Lilith 
mythologies that come out of that, and the um, Zadokim, or the Kodazim, and they actually reversed the letters when groups of them became, you know, fallen. They reversed them, so you had the Lilibim turned into the sons of Belil, and you had the uh, Kodazim becoming the, the sons of Zadok. And these became prominent figures in the Atlantean period. I mean, at this point, we're still not into the height of Atlantean culture yet. These are Atlantean civilization really didn't come into being until, uh, let's see, when was it? When the Atlantean root race was seeded. Atlantis was, the, the, the place was there, the cloister races were there, but it wasn't technically called Atlantis. That was a root race. It was a smaller race than the human cloister races that were coming in. It was a, you know, a smaller branch of the human races. So anyway, this is the, the step-by-step process that the Leviathan or the Illuminati races were created from. They were progressively crossed, and the idea was to get them up to strand five, where they would take the reverse 11 DNA pattern and work strand one all the way up to strand five into non-reversal through the hybridization. At that point, they could pass through Stargate 5 into the Terran time field in Density 2. You could get them out of here, and they could continue their evolution from there to get the next set of strands. But all along, every step of the way, there were raider races, fallen angelics, that came in and grabbed portions of them and hybridized with them and then used them as tools to create their little armies where they would go raid other villages. I mean, it, it's still, even in our recorded history, it's classic, the plundering of one group that conquers another. They come in, they rape the women, they you know, trash the society, they force their belief systems on them. Well, there are pro- continually more children being born by the raping of uh, angelic human females. They would very often come into a village, raid it, kill the males, and rape the females, and kidnap them, keep them until they found out whether they conceived or not. And if they conceived, they would, you know, bear the children. There is a big hatred vibe that a lot of women carry from being a part of that time period where they hate children. And when they have their own children, they don't mean to hate children, but this emotional thing comes up where there's almost a desire to kill children because there was a violation that was done in that period, like in this, you know, pre-Atlantean period, where you were being forced to carry something that somebody else forced you to get pregnant with that was not going to have a human soul. It was going to have a fallen angelic soul. They would birth that dark avatars in this way. And the women that were angelic humans that were forced into this type of breeding felt not only violated, but they knew they were contributing to the potential downfall of this planet. So they, there was a whole movement in the female consciousness that went into killing their offspring whenever they could because they knew the souls coming into them were not human and they were, you know, of the other side. So there's still, this is some of the stuff we're still healing on a deep level. Women have a lot of that. And there's an anger that was in men. They felt very emasculated in the whole situation. They come in and be killed. They didn't, they didn't want them for anything because they weren't gestation chambers like females were. So there's a lot of things we're still processing from this period. The Leviathan races, by the time um, we got up to, let me see, where uh, the last, yeah, n- number five, uh, the fifth upgrade. The fifth upgrade didn't come until 68,000 B.C. That's because there was a whole lot of other crazy things, like from 148,000 B.C. to 75,000 B.C. That's a long period of time. It was called the Anu occupation. Humans actually lived underground because the Pleiadian Nibiru and Anunnaki had got together and they'd come in and they'd taken over surface earth. So they were literally, they literally took over surface earth and destroyed anything that wasn't of theirs and were trying to either kill or kidnap and use human populations. So literally human civilization went underground. A lot of us will have cellular memory that's about that, where we'll actually remember times when we were so sensitive we could hear a footstep hundreds of feet up, up, above, you know, up above us in, uh, because we lived underground. There are still many chambers that are left of the civilizations that were there. And there are other ones that were run by the, the negative ones as well because there were periods when they went underground in relation to the dinoids, the you know, dinosaur things. But anyway, well, because of the craziness that took place, that's a very long period of time. This is why the Anunnaki decided they owned the planet because they come in and stole it so they figured it's theirs. You know, that's a typical, it's really the typical thing if you look at any of the, the politics that we're in the middle of right now. 
I mean, they're all fighting over stuff they stole from somebody else in the first place. It's like, <laughs> anyway, when we get up to um, 68,000 BC, they finally did the last upgrade, and this was um, taking them from the Iluli Nephi up to the Anu Melchizedek. This is where they were crossed with the fifth strand. They picked up the fifth angelic human DNA strand, the cloister strand of the Melchizedek. And this is out of these guys. They end up with the Templar Melchizedek and the Templar Melchizedek priesthood, which is the total opposition to the cloister. Once in a while, when they decide to enter the Emerald Covenant, they actually assist. But most of the history, the Templar Melchizedek were the ones that were the front men and beings for the Wiesedek. And there was a version of them that were also in the uh, Phantom Matrix. So you had a division between them. One was for the Wiesedek bonding, the other Metatronic bonding. The other group of them was for the Phantom bonding. But both of them were not anything to do with the Emerald Covenant. And right now, most of the Melchizedek on the planet, the ones that woke up first, the ones that are going around and transmitting frequency to everybody and initiating them into the Melchizedek priesthood, most of them are Templars, which means most of them are Anunnaki. So anyway... This was the, process, the, the progression, and I wanted the people who didn't hear this before to understand the progression of where these Leviathan Illuminati races that we talk about, where they came from. And it also answers the question of the Darwinian stuff. Where did the you know, Neanderthal and the Cro-Magnon, where do they fit? Were these our you know, human ancestors? No, they were not. They were the hybrid ancestors. The only connection to human they had was a little bit of human genetics that was put into their pattern to assist them to evolve to a higher level. They are not what we came out of at all. But there's been a whole movement since Atlantis. It was part of the Luciferian Covenant, which was an agreement made by the fallen um, Anu Elohim races, the Anunnaki races, that they would progressively orchestrate something called transposition of race identity. We're progressively using radio body programming, using genetic progressive genetic infiltration, they would transpose their race identity over the angelic human and the indigo race identity, and they would take over the planet. And taking over the planet meant bringing it into phantom and then into Wiesedek matrix. So this has been a long, long process here. This will give you some idea of how much we've all invested in this drama. There's a lot of vested interests going on here. This is why they're not going to say, oh, they're busted, they're, you know, they're, they're blowing the whistle on us, they're telling on us, we'll just go away. They're not going to do that. This is the ending point of this drama and the beginning of a new series of dramas. Three new ones, in fact, three new paths of Genesis. Now, from Atlantis, I want to show you really quickly. We start with the fact that you have these races, one collective of hybrids that are being run by the Toth Collective that are played in Nibiruan, and another group that came from the Nephi level and up that were run by the Enoch group. Now, the Enoch group was representative of the Jehovian Anunnaki, the ones that considered themselves the pure strains, that they weren't mixed with the seraphim. Then you had the Toth ones that were the Anu seraphim, the mixed ones. So you had four basic groups at this point. You had um, the Lilibim, which were the ones of Toths that were still on the, uh, the Christos evolutionary path. And then you had the ones that were made... Uh, of reversing that, reversing the DNA of those guys. And they were the sons of Belil. And you had on the Enoch side the uh, Kodazim, which were the ones still in the Christos path, and then the Zadokim, the sons of Zadok, which were the ones who went into reversal. Now, they didn't go into reversal all at once. There were experiments being made by hijacking them at every stage of evolution. But it really came to a head where the formalization of the sons of Belil and the sons of Zadok came in the Atlantean period after 25,500 B.C. It began with 22,326 B.C. when Toth's group went uh, defected from the Emerald Covenant. And Toth made deals with the Anunnaki races from um, Alpha and Omega Centauri. This is what you get the, where you get the Alpha and Omega order Melchizedek races for or Melchizedek's. For anybody that knows about the Melchizedek, you know, or... Um, ordination systems, they say, you know, we are of the Alpha Omega order. You'll also find that in books like the Enoch books, you know, of the Alpha and the Omega. They, when Toth made deals with the Alpha Omega order, we Sedek Anunnaki hybrids, this is when the fire sword initiations began, which means this is when he allowed his hybrids 
that he was put in charge of their evolution and getting them back into the Christos pattern, he allowed them, without asking them, he allowed them to begin receiving the frequencies transmissions of the flaming blue sword of Archangel Michael, that D D13 reverse current that would begin the process of reversing their whole template. That began technically in 22,340 BC, before, right before the... Uh, the 326 BC, the 22,326 BC, still activation cycle. That was the beginning of bringing fully into our race line the Metatronic distortion. Now it began there. Enoch still held out. Enoch didn't defect from the Emerald Covenant until uh, 10,500 BC in something that was called the Luciferian Conquest, where he basically felt cornered because the Anunnaki, of the, had, the, the Wisedex had already taken over so much here that he joined with the Toth groups. And they together agreed to take their sons of um, Belil and create something called the Sons of Zadok from reversing Enoch's people, reversing their DNA templates, and then combining them to create a master race. And they weren't the only ones. You had draconian races trying to get on, in on the picture. It was like, who can snatch whose bodies and make a new race strain out of it? And it was all geared toward, originally, they wanted to just get it done with in 22,326 BC. Stellar activation cycle, we get the place into reversal, suck it down in the Wiesedek matrix, and that's that. Have our final conflict drama, because it's either going to go into Phantom or go into Wiesedek. So those guys were fighting with each other. Which way is it going to go? Um, because we ended up in stalemate in 22,326 BC. We're still here to talk about it. But the history that has come since that point has been horrendous. In, after, the, uh, af after this time frame, after Toth had gone over and began the prying, I have to take this off. I'm getting really hot. Are you guys getting hot? Yeah, yeah, yeah. you can open the door if you want. I think it's really hot in here. Now, this is where, and I brought you up to the point where this fits in. <laughs> This is what happened from Atlantis, all right? You see all those lines going down? They're different race lines. This has nothing to do with human evolution. This is the hybrid evolution of the Illuminati races, okay? Yeah. It starts basically with several of the groups. Remember how we said we had the, uh, the Enki, Enlil, and Marduk groups of the Pleiadian Niberians? Well, each of them created a strain by raiding the sons of Belil, all right? So it, <laughs> I, it'll take me forever to try to read all of this. You had the Toth Enki group, you had the uh, Enlil group, which were Enlil Odetokron, so they were the, you know, had more reptilian coding to them. You had the Marduk races, and these are called the Marduk Luciferians, and then you had the Marduk uh, Satanes. This is where you get Lucifer and Satan. These were combined. They were family lines that combined with different things in the uh, uh, off-planet, you know, in their home environments, and then took those gene codes and put them down into here, into the Leviathan races. So we ended up with a huge line of both Anunnaki, oh, another one of them is the Sun, Samjaze Luciferian Anunnaki, which are the ones, the Pleiadian ones. So if you hear, you know, it's funny, there's, a, I think, a person named Billy Meyer that's had contact with some Jazzy the Pleiadian, and she comes down in her spaceship to visit. <laughs> well, guess where she lives? <laughs> she lives in the Pleiades. She's one of these guys. There's, uh, these were the beginnings of the primary Atlantean king lines, the Leviathan or Illuminati king lines. There were also the Drax side, or the ones that were of the, the fallen seraphim races. You had the Necromaton and Drummy, which were ones that were the first, one of the first combined with Wiesedek, where you had uh, the Andromi races that were primarily, they were Jehovian Anunnaki, and they combined with the Necromaton. And, I mean, they combined with the uh, Wiesedeks to form the Necromaton. When you get into who combined with who and where'd you get Drac or where'd you get Anunnaki, it gets confusing because there were a bunch of Wiesedek races that were hybridized with, Am like, say, Omicron Draconian, and then that taken and hybridized with Anunnaki. The more code you could collect, the better your master invader race would be. So we ended up with a group called the Necromaton and Drami ones, the Odetokron reptilian ones that kept pretty much the Pierce train Odetokron ones. Some of them went, went bad as far as, you know, 
even though they started out as a race that fell that didn't really mean to, some of them went into complete fall, where they began to make that choice to stay fallen. So there are reptilians that chose the fall uh, after, at this point. There are also the Omicron draconians, or the dragon moths. Okay? Now, each of them created a whole line of beings that progressively evolved through time. There's, uh, on this side, when we get this chart done, there's like dates over here as to who became what when, and then it shows which branched off and which combined with what to create the next level. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the most important ones that I wanted to bring up here have to do with the Atlantean, the basic Atlantean king lines. There were a group, there was one, two, three, four, five. There were basically five groups that were involved with the, the Palladian Nibiruan crew. They were the Sathians, the uh, Ilulkum, the Idiruans, the Lilithan, and the Azuriel. Various ones of them combined to form what became known as the Atlantean king lines. The Enlil, Odetokron, um, were the ones who were the Idiruans. They evolved to become the uh, Nohasa Atalan king line. So you have an Atalan king line. You will also have, as we come down, an Atlas king line, an Osiris king line, a Larsa king line. And the Larsa kings, they found evidence and lists. The Larsa king lists were tablets that were found in Samaria. So this stuff plugs right in to the archaeological, uh, archaeological evidence they managed to uh, miss when they were doing their house cleaning in 9,558 B.C. Out of these lines, which it would probably take me another hour to try to go down and show you where everybody, you know, comes out. When we get down to time period, oh, Remus and Romulus are in here where Rome started. Now, on this side, anyway, I'll just show you. In this section of the, the graph, okay, coming down, like straight down from this area over here toward the middle. Okay, would you please, thank you. Over here, you basically have the ones that were from the Toth lineage. And over here, you have, uh, in, in the middle, all right, over here, you have more of the Toth lineage. Coming down this way, you have ones that were the Enoch lineage. And then over here, you have ones that were the Draconian ones, the, the Odetokron reptilian and the Draconian ones. So literally, these created, every one of them created their... Antichristos king lines, their Antichristos grail lines. And they came from Atlantis. And when they, we get up to a certain point, so there's certain interesting points in history here. Let me see. I wanted to get, where's Rome? <laughs> 5,900 BC, that's before. 7,700 BC, where is that? Okay, in here we basically have uh, time periods such as, all right, the 9,558 B flood. That was a contrived flood that was orchestrated by the members of the Luciferian Covenant. The Luciferian Covenant was run by all of these guys, the Tothian uh, Anunnaki, the Pleiadian Nibiru and Anunnaki crew. And Enoch at that point had entered the Luciferian Covenant, which means he brought his race lines into the Metatronic coding. And it also meant he started to participate and his races started to participate in the attempted hijack of the planet. Part of the Luciferian Covenant, which was originally uh, founded in 10,500 BC, part of that was to stage a wipeout and a house cleaning, where once certain things were done to the memory banks here, in the planetary memory banks, once the Nibiruan um, dyadic crystal grid thing that was set up at Stonehenge, once that was pumping enough of the program through the grids, there would be uh, any race time where we get rid of the history and the races, whatever races that they didn't particularly want. In 9,558 BC was the period of time that they used the crystal generators because at this point we still had Atlantean technology. You had massive selenite crystal rods that were positioned under the ocean beds in various regions connected to the stargates and those kind of things. And they, they used them to collapse part of the firmaments again. And this created, it wasn't the biggest flood that's ever been here. It wasn't the great, great deluge. But it was large enough to allow for, it created a, a small amount of pole shift. That's where we got our, our wobble from. You know how the planet has its wobble. Well, that's where the wobble came from. It was already out of alignment from the other messes that had taken place before. But that was the last one. Now, in 9,558 B.C., 
there was uh, spaceships flying all over the place because the ones that they wanted to preserve were taken into shelter. Our guys knew it was coming and we couldn't stop it. So we literally got our, as many of the angelic humans into the inner earth as could come. And at that point, at least they had some DNA left to, to play with. You know, like right now, our, we're much more mutated in the DNA than we were at that point. The mutations had been started, but they hadn't been fully finished by then. So um, in 9558 BC, we had our house cleaning and our records cleaned out. Literally, the history records were taken, were destroyed, so we wouldn't have any reference. And progressively, the survivors after this point, there was still the knowledge, the grail line, the true grail line races and the angelic humans knew. They remembered what the history was. They, they knew the Atlantean history and that was a problem because there were genetic alterations through the fire sword initiations that were being done on the Leviathan races that made them progressively not be able to remember anything except the Metatronic programming. So it was like their radio bodies were being plugged in and fed the CD player or the CD, you know, C the CD-ROM program that was being run from the Metatronic WISADEC system. They were losing their memory. Their memory was being literally recoded right in their own DNA. But it wasn't affecting the angelic humans to that degree. They still remembered. They were still a problem. And they were going around teaching the Leviathan races, remembering them, helping them to wake up and remember. And you don't want to do this. You really don't. This is why you don't remember. This is how it is. And a lot of the Leviathan races were coming back into the Emerald Covenant, which meant the fallen angelics were losing their foot soldiers. So there was a progressive series of things done from 9,558 BC, the big one culminating in 3,470 um, BC. Where is that? That's up here. Where there was a final shift in the magnetic fields on the planet that literally shut down everybody's DNA. It created a, a temporary, like if you shut your computer off and had to reboot. And when it rebooted, half of it was turned off. So literally, even the angelic humans lost their full memory banks at that point. They'd already taken the written records away in 9,558 BC, and they got rid of monuments. They got rid of literally awesome buildings. There used to be beautiful Atlantean temples and those kind of things. that are nothing like the, the pieces of stuff that are falling down that we see now as ruins. These, I mean, really, you know, there's something really been lost in the translation after the flood period as far as architecture. But that's because we haven't had the power of, say, the onks and those kind of things. The onks were a technology that was standard in Atlantis. And if we remember the, the, the uh, Crux and Seda field, that's formed in, with, with the Merkaba field. The onks were tools that could actually generate small fields like that, so you could do all sorts of things with them. Once the flood had occurred and things were, basically the Anunnaki were taken over the planet again, um, those tools were taken into inner earth and not allowed back out here because too much damage could be done with them. So we were back on manual where you had to like lift blocks to move them, you know, like with your hands instead of levitate them with a, with a little handy little onk. So anyway, this whole progression, you have 9,558 BC flood, the 3,470 BC, uh, 3,470 BC, um, we call that the, uh, that, that was recorded in the Bible as the Tower of Babel thing, as the Babylon Massacre, because we've been babbling on ever since. That's when they scrambled the languages. That's when we lost our cellular memory. And that's when they began to really amalgamate the races, where now angelic humans didn't remember anymore that they were different. Perfect place to get the grail lines in where they're clueless and we can direct them. So from this point on, we have been guided. We come up into more recent history. In through this period, yeah. Now in through this period from like, um, what are the dates on this? 700 and something. Actually, it starts around 11, 1100 BC. We get into like the beginning formations of what became the Roman Empire and those kind of things. These were all invader empires. The Egyptian empire was an invader empire. Pharaohs were not part of the Christic pattern. They were the Anunnaki raider races that came in here. We look and we go, oh, aren't they pretty temples and all this kind of stuff. And we go over to Egypt and check out the stuff. If we knew the history on them, we wouldn't be so impressed. They're evidence, living evidence of, our, of the invasion of this planet by Anunnaki races. So in through this section, we have where the Roman culture began. When the natural people, the Stargate Five people, that were the original Greek and Roman, you know, peoples, um, were invaded and progressively transposition of race identity was done to them. They were either killed if they wouldn't cooperate and they were hybridized with to progressively infiltrate the Leviathan gene code into 
you know, into their stock, into their genetic stock. This happened literally at different times within every culture on this planet. It was planned and it was orchestrated. And we're the, right now, what's on the planet is the product of this. We have the creation of Rome down here. We get into fun stuff where we get into the, like the Jesus story. And we find out that Abraham's line came through from this section over here. It was when some of the Toth groups, some of the sons of Belil and the sons of Zadok combined down here to create what's called the Hyksos. The Hyksos kings, they're also in our written history. Um, they don't know much about them, but the Hyksos became, they, they ended up doing a transposition of race identity on the Hebrew lines and also in various other ones. But Abraham was one of those. So all of the descendants of Abraham were originally Hyksos. They had nothing to, Abraham had nothing to do with the Hebrew peoples. The tribes that are listed in the Bible right now have nothing to do with the angelic human history. We've literally had an alien race come in here and transpose over our history records and our identity, mess with our DNA, wipe out our memory via the planetary magnetic fields, and literally make us think that we're their children. Our history was very different than this. So these, this chart is interesting because it shows you all sorts of things. It, it, it shows you the invasion how the various cultures were invaded and hybridized and their gene code progressively diluted and turned into reversal through forced hybridization with these raider races. It happened to the Celts. It happened to everybody at, a, you know, at different times. The Hindus got it in 5,900 BC. I mean, there, it was just like, if you look, like, once this chart is done, it's going to be really phenomenal. But this is what got us up to the present moment and the present predicament that we're in.